With the support of the European Parliament, this is the first event of our Europe Direct Centre for 2014. And we are really honoured to have Mary O'Rourke, Shane Dunphy, Tim Hayes and Jim Power here in our wonderful Theatre Royal in Waterford this afternoon. And they're going to talk about Ireland's future in Europe and the world. Just if you could bear with me for a minute, I'd just like to put the event into context. Waterford Europe Direct Information Centre in Central Library has been providing European information to a region basically stretching from Dublin to Cork since 2009. And it's one of 10 centres around the country. With the help of the European Commission, each centre offers publications, advice and information to citizens on European issues. And the centres also provide a direct phone line to Brussels where you can get expert advice on any issue as well as internet access to EU websites and speakers and seminars and events to inform the public about European priorities and policies throughout the year. And just to say this event wouldn't have happened today without the hard work and support of a number of people. And I'd just like to take a minute to thank those people now. I'd like to thank the staff of the European Parliament and the European Commission. I'd like to thank Annette Kelly and Ruth Montague from Libraries Development LGMA. And of course, I'd like to say a big thanks to Sinead O'Higgins and the staff in Waterford City Library and Shane Dunphy and the students in Waterford College of Further Education. You've all worked very hard to make this event happen today and we're very much looking forward to an interesting and a lively discussion. And finally, now I would like to very much welcome Mary O'Rourke to Waterford City as we start to celebrate our 1100 birthday celebrations. Mary needs no introduction, having spent many years in Fianna Fáil as a Fianna Fáil TD and indeed as deputy leader of the party. And she's known to you all as a woman of many interests and talents and indeed forthright views, which I expect we might hear some of this afternoon. Shane Dunphy is also very well known to you as an author, a journalist, and of course, a lecturer of many of you in w, uh, the Waterford College of Further Education. So basically to start this afternoon, Shane will interview Mary on what Europe is all about. And then we'll have a panel discussion with Waterford native and well-known economist Jim Power, as well as the EC representa re representation's head of information and communication, Tim Hayes. Then there'll be time for discussion and debate and questions from yourselves, and we expect to wrap up around 3.15 or 3.30. If I could just finish by mentioning to you that the fire exits, there appear to be two at the back, and uh, yeah, two at the back of the auditorium. And then if I could just remind you to check that your mobile phones are turned off. Thank you, and now I, could, I would like you to put your hands together to welcome Mary O'Rourke and Shane Dunphy. Thank you very much. Mary, thank you very Hello, much Shane. for coming. How are you? Thank you. Um, Mary and I, as um, you've already been told by Jane, we're going to um, chat for um, a little while just to kind of lay the foundations for what the debate is going to be about. Um, so let's get straight to it. Mary, um, I'm going to personalise it a little bit first of all. Um, talk to me about what inspired you to want to get into politics in the first place. Put yourself back maybe at the, when you were a student like so many of the people in front of us, what caused you to want to go into politics? Well, it was long before that now. Really? Okay. Yes, and I hope this is working. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah it was um, when I was very young, so many, many years ago, my father in Athlone was the local town councillor and county councillor and sort of Mr. Fianna Fáil in the town. So when all those big wigs from Fianna Fáil would come to visit, or to, at that time there were a lot of open air lectures out in a square or maybe on a mall, uh, like a mall you had here wherever, we had one of those in the river as well, near the river as well. But whenever they, they would come, they would always come down to our house afterwards. <laughs> Now, there were four of us in our house. There was my brother, Brian, passed away, God rest him. My brother, Paddy, passed away. My sister, Anne, alive and thriving, and myself. And I was the youngest, the tail end of all of those. So when there'd be the big open-air meeting in the Market Square, and they would come back to our house, all the men, all the men, and my father would all 
go into this big living room and I would be, and my sister would be put to bed. Now, we were young, but um, I was always listening and I'd creep up the corridor, put my ear to the door to try to hear what they were talking about you. I wanted to know what was this wonderful manly talk that their voices would go up and they'd go down and they'd go up and down then there'd be a fight and a roar and <laughs> all that and I, I said to myself someday I'm going to be part of all that and I did, was yeah. and when you decided this was the, the career path that you wanted to go down, in your head if you had to sum it up in maybe one word what did you think a politician did what was well, your now, role? I didn't get to that point of going to be one of those. First of all, I'd earned my living. Mm. And then um, I went to UCD and I did arts. And then okay. I did an HDIP. And I taught in a secondary school uh, in What did you Athlone. teach? I taught English and history. When I started with Latin, I was a Latin teacher. Now they don't teach Latin anymore. It's a great pity. Oh, it mm. is a lovely, terrific mm. language. I, I started at that. Then I went English and Latin. So I did that for some years. And then I joined my local organisation. So you've asked me, what did I think politicians did? Well, I'll tell you very simply. I thought they always were doing things. Now, ask me to explain doing. That they always seem to be busy talking, doing, visiting, saying big speeches. Oh, I could see myself making saying big <laughs> speeches, yes. I thought they always were very busy people. But I always thought they were people who tried to help people. Mm. They, I would see my father being a counsellor when I was a child. They would come to the house to see him at night. Some people would come. And my father I trained me very early because I was very young. I was way younger than the boys or my sister. I was, I was in charge of opening the door to them. And they would, I would say, will you sit down, please? And my daddy be with you soon. <laughs> and he always told me to be nice about it and polite. And I did. And they'd have their chat. And then I'd go to the door with them. And I noticed they always were in better humour when they were leaving him. So I thought whatever wise words he had. So anyway, that was just my childhood. So I taught for a while. And then I joined the local Fianna Fáil organisation in Athlone. And then the local elections came, as they are coming here now on May the 22nd. And um, I, my common asked me if I would like to go for common as a group, if I would like to go forward, if I would represent them. So I did, and I got in. Okay. Mm. That was the beginning. And what was that like, getting oh, in? It was great. I was very... I think if you're elected by your townspeople, which was that time there was an Athlone Urban District Council, alas, they all are to be no more, to be merged into county councils now. But um, if you are elected by the citizens of your town, it's a very big... A piece of confidence in you, a mark of confidence in you. I thought so anyway. Yes, indeed. And um, I loved it. There were uh, nine members. There were eight men and myself and the town clerk and county manager. And I thought I was really important. <laughs> you know, in front of me was my name, Mrs. Mary O'Rourke. I said, gee, I have it made. <laughs> <laughs> I did really, yeah, yeah. And when you, when you, when you got in, so when you, now you're finally doing the job, yeah. was it what you expected it to be? Were you doing and helping and making those speeches? I was, I was doing and helping. I was a lot of that. I very rapidly became a sort of somebody that people, I think mainly women, would come to me about housing matters. Um, Athlone is a big or not at all like Waterford to speak of that but it's a big urban centre and there were always housing difficulties and I noticed women would come to see me about their lack of housing or their need for a bigger house or a better house or whatever so I, I kind of made a speciality of that if you like. I remember thinking well look I was teaching at that time too if everybody could get a good education in Ireland everything would be all right and then I thought if everybody could get a good house in Ireland, everything would be all right. So, you know, I had aspirations. Sure. Mm. They say that all politics in, in Ireland anyway comes back to the, the parish pump at the end of the day. Oh, that do. it's, yeah. and I see it's small things. That. Yeah, and absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Taking that in the context of what we're here to talk about this afternoon, Europe and mm. European politics, how does that transfer? For somebody like yourself or another Irish politician who's used 
to dealing with issues that come down to often very simple yes, local yeah. things. How does Europe differ? Well, I don't think it differs because, but I do think it has to be made more, made more relevant and more nearby. You know, we're a small island, off a small island, off the coast of Europe. So we're a long, long way from, you might say, Brussels or Strasbourg or the heart of Europe. So I think what it's up to all of us to do, and the main purpose of why I'm here this evening, apart from coming to lovely Waterford, and coming to this, isn't this a lovely Theatre Royal, isn't it? You'd feel like kicking your legs up if I was able to, <laughs> but it really is lovely. And uh, is that to bring, bring it home how important it is that people feel an ownership of Europe. And we can do that in several ways. You can first do it by voting. I cannot understand, I don't know if I can see you all, I can't see your faces. I cannot understand people who won't vote or who don't vote. You have a gift in your hand. The card comes to your door, your, call, your voting card, or if it doesn't come and you're on the register, you just go up to your local polling booth. But I cannot understand that you have the gift of voting and that you don't use it. I never missed an election or a referendum, local, national, European, anything in my whole life. I can't envisage anyone that won't vote. So please, I'll be saying it again at the end, but please vote. It is so important. And that gives you, that brings me back to your question. Yes. That gives you the ownership. If you, you can't, if you don't vote, you can't go giving out. I hate hurlers on the ditch. They don't go voting, but they go into the local pub and they give out about Mrs. Her and Mr. Who. And if you don't vote, you have no stake. If you vote, you have a stake in what is happening. And I do think the European deputies, the European direct offices of which Jane was speaking, we can go to your library if it's one of those, and it is here, and they will put you directly into Europe. They have all the, the forms and all the details of Europe. Europe, while it may be, in miles wise, a long way away, it isn't really. Remember, you know, I think sometimes we forget that we were all part of Europe. You know, you if you were look, and I'm sure many of you have been to places like Germany, and um, particularly back into Switzerland, there are churches everywhere with Irish saints' names on them. And we went all those years to tell people about our religion. But now, don't ask me how we got there. Well, I mean, the, Vi the Vikings got here 1,100 years ago. They did. So I'm not going back that far, but we it was did. even pre-Ryanair. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> pre-Ryanair, yes. But so Irish people always traveled. So we are essentially within us. We are Europeans. And I think you can claim ownership of Europe if you become interested in it, if you want to know who your local MEP is, the elections I told you are when, go into your library, read up about it, be interested in Europe because we are a part of Europe. Why, why so. do we need it though, Mary? If you think about Europe as a continent, there's all of these different cultures, all of these different nation states, all of these different languages and ways of mm. being. Why do we need to come together as a single political and economic entity? What, what's the reasoning or rationale well, behind it? Well, the real it? draw of it is that we are attempting, and we're <coughs> doing very well, becoming a market economy. We're uh, an export-driven economy. And because we are then, we have a huge open market there for us. 28 countries now. 28 countries, all part of Europe. So that we, ha if we're... If you're a small little entrepreneur, perhaps making things and going on your email and having your website, Europe is your oyster if you're making something special and doing something special. Look what we're doing with our agricultural sector, all our exports that are going about. So the first thing is the market. We have our, a ready-made market with, because we're guaranteed by, the, by one of the European referendums which we passed the freedom of services, the freedom of markets, freedom of people to move about. So there is that. But I think there's a deeper philosophical reason. And it's the one, I love history, and I'm sure there's many in this hall, in this lovely Theatre Royal, that are historians. Um, I think the idea that we are together, that there's a solidarity amongst all the peoples of Europe, together, philosophically, 
you know it, it started after the excesses and the terrible events of World War II in particular, well, World War I too, but then World War II, deciding that they come together. And there is that certainty of being part of a whole, whole lot of states, that you are European. I feel really proud within me to be European. And I think Irish people in general do. When things went a little bit wrong for us yes, a few they years back and they, they yeah. okay mm -hmm. I was trying to be under, understated yes, a little I bit know. but they, they, when things went disastrously wrong for us a little while ago um, some of us were very glad that we were members of Europe because yes. we could look Call to somebody to help yeah. us and others were not so happy because there was all of this issue of us losing our sovereignty and losing our identity and there, there was many conflicting mm, voices. There were emotions. Yes, yes absolutely. Mm. Now we, we all know that the background to that and what happened and the bailout and all the rest of us, mm. but we've heard a tremendous amount of talk about the Troika, the Troika doing this and the Troika doing that and the Troika insisting that we do this and that mm. and the Troika leaving. Um, could you explain what the Troika is? <laughs> well, they sound like three witches, don't they? <laughs> but that's wrong. That's not what they they're are. They're not witches, then? No, they're oh. not. <laughs> the Troika, to break it down, it's the um, International Monetary Fund, IMF. There is the ECB, which is the European Central Bank, and there's the European Commission. So there are three bodies of people who... Live in, well, the IMF is Washington-based, but Paris and other places as well. The other two are Europe-based. And when we, it's not that we ran out of money, but our getting credit was getting higher and higher percentage-wise. And we all know the back up to that, and we know that for many years, or oh, two or three or four or five, all those years, the coffers were being full of money coming in from construction. And we were relying on running the country based on the taxes coming in from building and construction. And they were massive. They were huge. And we, um, we used that up and we were still okay. We were still able to manage. But in 07 came a worldwide, we are inclined to think because we think about Ireland, but this was a worldwide collapse in financial sectors, particularly I think triggered by Lehman Brothers, that was 07 to not not 07. And from that then, the, the tensions and the frissons developed all over the world, particularly <coughs> then Europe, then in Europe in particular countries, and we were one of them, Ireland, our banking system went completely to the ground. The banks had led, lent money um, to those huge developers. The developers went to the ground. Now I'm only sketching the background, but all of that, happened in our small country. Now, to go on to what you said, people felt, some people felt, rightly or wrongly, that we lost our sovereignty by attaching ourselves to the Troika or having to be rescued by the Troika. I would never have held that because the, when, when we went into Europe, first of all, we have our particular identity, but we linked our identity to Europe so the very special sovereignty of we being a country alone, alone. No, we were no longer that. We were part of Europe. Secondly, they didn't give us money. They loaned us money and we're paying it back. So there is not like, there were not this great paternalistic feeling, here's money for little Ireland. No, no. Yes, they loaned us money at a rate we could afford and we took those loans and we are now paying them back. Now we come to the point of they're gone and we were all meant to beat drums and go out singing and throw your legs up here on the theatre. Or, the or weep and wail in, in terror, depending on which or side of the fence you were on. I just feel they went, but they're not gone, you know. <laughs> Who was it? It doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I forget. But it, they're not gone at all because they're keeping, uh, they're not coming every three months, but I think twice a year they will come and visit the, um, the uh, ambassadors from those three bodies. They change, I think, from time to time. And they will see how we're getting on in their absence. And I think, in the general, I know there was a lot of hardship. I'm quite well aware of that. But there was also a lot of things we needed to do. If we're very honest with one another, and if we face up to it, look into the mirror, sort of, um, there were things that needed to be done. And they forced us into legislation that we might never have done, 
to be more on the straight path. Now, they're going to keep a distance, but they're going to keep an eye, a good BD, three eyes on us, three <laughs> sets of eyes. So it's not all over. That's my point. Okay. Yeah. But we were, because we were part of Europe, we could call on them and they could call on us. Now you will have the tale told, and some of it there will be a germ of truth in it, that Europe did not want us to collapse because it would have set the headlines for Greece and Spain and Portugal and all those other countries which went anyway. <coughs> but they didn't want us to be the first to go. So it was a come and go sort of a relationship. Okay, well, I think at that juncture, it's a yeah. good place to maybe hear from <laughs> our two panellists. So, Jim, would you like to take the podium first, please? Um, now, each of the panellists is going to speak, set out their stall. Um, we're going to give them each two minutes to just kind of outline what their particular perspective on Europe is. Okay, so um, I have my assistant over in the, uh, the wings here, Karen. So, have you got two minutes on the clock? And off you go. Right. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'll just give you a very, from my perspective, a very quick perspective on where we are or what Europe means to me. Um, I have to say I travel a lot uh, and I, I feel a hell of a lot more at home in London, New York, Boston, San Francisco than I do in Frankfurt, Paris or Rome. So I suppose I'd have a very Anglo-Saxon view of the world. Uh, because I prefer it as a model, but that, that's a personal perspective. But that's kind of irrelevant because Ireland is an integral part of the European Union. Um, it was set, I suppose Ireland's participation in Europe has been amongst the most constructive across Europe. We've always been at the vanguard of deeper integration into the European model. Many reasons for that, some historical, um, you know, not least the need to break our dangerous reliance on the UK, uh, particularly from a political, or particularly from a political perspective. So Ireland is a committed member of the European Union. We were one of the founding members of the single European currency. And I suppose one of the concerns I had with the single European currency, and it's one of the concerns I have with Europe in general, is that I think a lot of what happens and the single currency was undoubtedly a victory for politics over economics. The single currency for all of the countries that signed up did not make economic sense because they did not fulfill the criteria of an optimum currency area. And I haven't enough time to get into that, unfortunately. But be that as it may, we joined the currency. Um, and I think a lot of the problems we've been dealing with over the last five or six years, particularly the evolution of a bubble economy, had a lot to do with our membership of the single European currency. But to use the old hackneyed phrase, we are where we are. We cannot go back and revisit that whole process because there are suggestions around the place that Ireland should now exit the single European currency. In my view, that would be economic and political suicide. Uh, we've got to keep going. We've got to push the agenda now. And Time up. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't kept to okay. two minutes. <laughs> I, I just want to conclude sure, on, on two yeah. points. One is that in terms of the Troika, um, I, I believe Ireland was hung out to dry in terms of the guarantee we gave to the banking system and the decision to, <laughs> the decision to guarantee bondholders in the banking system. And I believe the reason we did it was because if bondholders had been allowed to go to the wall, that we could have created a systemic banking problem in Europe. And, and that argument stands up very strongly. But the point is, if we give one for the team, we should now be rewarded by Europe. I don't believe the 35 billion that we give to Anglo and Irish Nationwide should fall on the shoulders of the Irish taxpayer. Uh, we did it to bail out Europe. We should be rewarded for it. And if we're not, I think we should question our relationship. I would, two points before I sit down, Shane. <laughs> we'll have to call security in a minute. You call you security, throw me out of the place. <laughs> You know, one point is that it is important to remember, to remember within the Troika, the IMF, the European Central Bank and the Commission. In my experience, the Commission was extremely pro-Ireland's position. Okay, and I would certainly regard the Commission and the IMF as allies rather than enemies of Ireland. The European Central Bank, I won't talk about. The, the final point is that in relation to the European elections next June, 
I think the importance of having good Irish people representing our interests in an increasingly integrated Europe is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. And if you look at people like, you know, I'm not being political about this, but Sean Kelly, Marion Harkin, um, Maureen McGuinness, you know, they are doing a fantastic job for Ireland on the European stage. We need more people like that out there. Pat so, the Cope. Pardon? Pat the Cope Gallagher. Oh, Jesus, sorry. <laughs> um, so I think it is important that, it's a fishing constituency, isn't that it? as an electorate we get involved in the European elections because we need good people representing Ireland's interests out there. Thank All you very right, much. Jim, thank you. Okay, Tim, we're going to aim for two minutes, but uh, I'm not sure how successful we're going to be. <laughs> Sorry, Shane. No. Okay, Karen, do we have two on the clock anyway, uh, aspirationally? Okay, we'll, we'll try and cover everything in two minutes. It's really <laughs> difficult to follow, Jim. I always try and speak. Last time I spoke in, in ahead of Jim because it's very difficult to follow. Listen, the question that I was asked was, what is Europe? Well, you know, Europe is a number of countries. It's out there, but we're also part of it. But the real question is, what is the European Union? Because the European Union really is only an experiment. It's something that we're sort of still feeling our way even after uh, 50 years of European Union, and Ireland has been in the European Union for 40 years on the 1st of January uh, last year. But the idea of the European Union is that it's a sharing of, of sovereignty, and we heard already, uh, Shane asked Mary the question about uh, the Troika and Ireland losing sovereignty. In fact, this is what the European Union is all about. It's about each country taking a little bit of its sovereignty mm -hmm. and giving that to the European Union. Because what each country is saying is, hey, you know, we think that things can be done better on a European Union level than on a domestic level. And this really is where the, where the crux is. Because the European Union can only act in certain specified areas. It has certain powers given to it by the treaty. And every time the treaty is changed, in Ireland, for example, there's a referendum. So the people actually decide what it is that the European Union can do. So the European Union as an organization is very democratic, uh, particularly as say, when you look at the, at the Irish example. Uh, we can do no more than the people ask us to do. We have no power, for example, to set a uh, minimum wages level. We have no power to set uh, the uh, level of health care. We have no power to set the level of social welfare. Why? Because the member states keep those powers to themselves. So the whole idea behind the European Union is a sharing of sovereignty. The European Union is good for Ireland. When Ireland joined the European Union back in, in 1973, 1st of January 1973, the um, uh, GDP per, per head of population in Ireland was about 60% of the, of the European average. Now, it, even in these hard times, it's still well over 120% of the uh, EU average. So Ireland has benefited from the EU. I'm old enough to remember the debates about Ireland joining the EU back in 1973, believe it or not. And at that time, the issue was agriculture and, and fisheries yeah. to, uh, to uh, a lesser extent. Two minutes, Tim. My two minutes are up. Okay, right, so I mean... Uh, we'll, we'll give you another one to wrap I'll, it up. I'll give you, know, I'll give me, uh, fairness. Right, I'll just take one, one minute, so to answer uh, Jim's... <laughs> allegation, accusation, whatever, let's call it a, a, an accusation. He was being very nice to the Commission. I'm, I'm part of the Commission, by the way, I'm within the, with the European Commission, and I worked in Brussels for 20-odd for years. While I worked in Brussels, during the time of the Celtic Tiger here, I would meet with other Irish people in the canteen, we'd sit down, we'd, we'd scratch our heads, and we'd say, do these people not see what they're doing to themselves? Because we could see from the early 2000s that everything was going wrong in Ireland. People were borrowing too much, mm. people were spending too much, all the numbers were wrong, okay? But everybody said, oh, it'll be soft landing, no problem, don't worry about it. We in the Commission came to the Irish and said, hey guys, you know, your economic policies are all wrong. And what did the Irish say to us? No, you're wrong. You know, Ireland is different. It will be different this time. It will never be the same again. Uh, unfortunately, the, the Commission was proved right. One mistake we made, in fact, in all of this, was that we weren't strong enough. Uh, we should have stood up to Charlie McCreevy at the time when he tried to overheat. Well, we told him he was overheating the Irish economy. But what did he do instead was he introduced uh, a special saving scheme so people could salt away money and then get more money at the end, thanks to the government. Anyway, uh, so what I'm trying to get across is that you know, the European Union is not something out there. We're all part of the European Union. It's very important to understand it. It's a very democratic uh, place because of the fact that we only work on the powers given by the people. 
And it's so important to get out and vote in the European Parliament elections because the European Parliament are the co-legislators. Every time a piece of legislation is created in Europe, it is not Brussels that creates it. There is no such thing as Brussels. It happens that some of the meetings are in Brussels, but it is the ministers from the member states and the members of the European Parliament together that make, these leg that make the legislations. So it's a cop-out to say it's not us that created it. It is us that created it. It's never them. It's always us. So thank you okay, very much. Thank you, Tim. Okay, um, what I'd like to do then is open, well, we'll come to the, we'll, yeah. we'll come, we'll give, give them a chance, they're just settling in, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is, is open up the debate uh, between the, the, the panel. So, um, when you two are finished carousing over there. Um, no, I was just pointing out that we were officially given three minutes in this. I talk, like to keep so. you on the half. Oh, you got three and a half. Don't nev never read <laughs> yeah, the small well, print. Never, the never read half. the small print. Um, okay. What I'd like to begin with is, and sure we'll start with with, with Jim. Um, could you give me one positive thing that you see coming down the line for Ireland in this post Troika environment, and one thing that we need to look out for? Maybe one negative aspect of this new situation because we're going through a period of flux at the moment so one positive and one negative well I, I, I see the positive um, quite simply there's clear evidence that the economy is starting to recover you know it, it's not give, give me some of the signs what are the signs of that okay if you look at the last if you look at the last two weeks we've had superb agricultural export results from Borbia, 9% growth, a 10 billion industry at this stage. We had a very strong foreign direct investment performance by the IDA last year. <laughs> Earlier this week, we had Enterprise Ireland announcing a pretty decent year in terms of net job creation for indigenous companies. Um, international confidence in Ireland has improved significantly, you know, as evidenced by the bond issuance last week, which went out, which went out at a rate of under 3.5% which is very positive. Um, what, what are bonds? Explain bonds. It's how the government borrows money. Okay. You know, when the government borrows money to finance our excessive deficit, they issue government bonds. And the rate we pay on those bonds um, is really determined by how much confidence investors have in our ability to repay the loans. So what happened to us when we entered the Troika um, was that international markets lost confidence in Ireland. They believed that if we lend more money to this country, the chances are we will not get it back. So they insisted initially on significantly higher rates of interest and eventually they refused to lend us money. We were locked out of markets. And when we entered the Troika, we had about six months money borrowed at that stage. And if the Troika had not come along and brought us into the program, given us access to 67 and a half billion, Ireland within six months would have had to slash 10 billion of expenditure overnight. Public services, education, health would have collapsed. Okay. So the Trika actually came to Ireland's rescue at that mm. stage and I welcomed it at the time and I believe that the influence of the Trika has been by and large benign. Okay? The one aspect which isn't related to the Trika was when that fateful decision was made to guarantee the banking system we should not have guaranteed bondholders. Some people argue that what has happened in Ireland is an indictment of free market economics. I believe if free market economics had been allowed to operate, bondholders who made an investment decision would have suffered the losses. That's how free markets should operate. What we saw in this country is what happens when governments interfere with the operation of the bond market. Bondholders who held bonds in Irish banks, they had literally come to terms with the fact they were going to lose a large part of that investment. They woke up the morning after the bank guarantee thinking that the fairy had come down the chimney. Mad stuff. Why did it happen? I have no idea. It's politics. You're an um, economist though, I mean, you, this, oh yeah, this was well, surely eco economics. The economic it? argument behind the politics was that um, if we allowed Irish banks, you know, uh, burn the so-called bondholders, that it would have created a systemic problem for the European banking system because a lot of other banking systems around Europe at that stage were also in serious, clearly in serious difficulty. We were just top of the queue at that point. So the, the, the European Union 
and the whole financial construct and so on is as weak or as strong as its weakest member. At that juncture, okay, we're 1% of the European Union economy or slightly less than 1%, but it doesn't matter, we could be 50% if Ireland had collapsed at that stage the impact on Europe would have been the same. It would have been catastrophic. So that, that was the political rationale. And as economists trying to um, analyze economic stories, you know, the one thing we struggle to cope with is the influence of the political system. It's easy to forecast if politicians behave rationally, okay? If they don't, you have a problem. Excuse me, allow me to interfere, please. Okay, Mary. You say you struggle to cope with politicians. We struggle. <laughs> Uh, to cope with ye as economists, I have to say exactly. You told us. You told us to go and commit suicide, for example. Well, no, I certainly wouldn't ask anyone. Well, Bertie Hearn did. My, my, my your, your uh, leader. Well, I'm no longer an active member. Let me tell no, you. No, at but the time. At the time. I find economists change their story and their voice, whatever it suits. You read one thing one week, one thing the next week. And politicians That's just, don't. I'm allowed to oh. say. I'm allowed to say my piece. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know what I came down to Waterford for. So, you Am say your piece talk? there, Mary. Yes, Please Mary. Say yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. God, you're really hogging it, aren't you? Right. <laughs> Sorry, he asked me oh. the question, Mary. <laughs> okay, good. T Tim, uh, g g a, p a positive and a negative for the, the, the current situation. Uh, okay, if I can, Shane, I'd like to start off with the, with the negative, with the, okay, with go the warning, for it, yeah. because I think, in fact, uh, Jim concentrated a bit on the positive. I want to come back on the positive and okay. answer some of these things. I, I think that the main a uh, thing that we should worry about for the European Union uh, in the next few years is Euroscepticism, and yeah. particularly the Euroscepticism that is coming to the fore right now in the United Kingdom. Mm. Explain because what you mean by Euroscepticism. Okay, so I mean the thing is that Ireland has traditionally been quite pro-Europe. Irish people say that Europe is a good thing, they want to be in Europe, they want to be in the single currency, they like it. In the UK, uh, a lot of the press, and particularly the so-called tabloids, the red-top newspapers, are very anti-European. The message mm. always is, you know, butt out of our business, Brussels, this sort of thing. And these are the headlines that, that you're getting the whole time. So people, particularly in the UK, believe that the European Union is a bad thing, that it's trying to take away their currency, it's trying to take away their measurements, uh, it's trying to force them to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do. So this is what we call Euroscepticism, where people really don't like Europe. Uh, and in the UK, you've got this UK independence party known as UKIP, uh, which are a big threat to the Conservative Party in the UK. So this is why David Cameron has said, right, in 2017, if I get back into power, I'm going to have a referendum on whether or not uh, mm. the UK uh, pulls out of, of Europe. So We fact, tend not to have that kind of extreme politics in Ireland, though. I mean, no. uh, Irish politics tends to run more down the centre, doesn't it? I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you, but I mean, it's very difficult for me to speak because I'm supposed to be apolitical. Mary's the one who should really ask, <laughs> ask that question of. Uh, what, what I, I, I'm concerned, as a bureaucrat, uh, I'm concerned about, you know, what image people have of the European Union. And it really pains me to think that, uh, particularly in Ireland, there is this uh, overflow of negativity coming mm. from the UK, which then creates a negative impact uh, in the minds of Irish people about the European Union. Because a lot of the people that are here in the audience are actually too young to remember uh, what Ireland was like before Ireland joined the European Union. Ask your parents, okay? When a woman was working in the civil service and got married, she had to leave her job. Can you believe it? Imagine. She mm. had to leave her job. She could not continue to work as a married woman. They were two different salary scales, one for a married man and the other for a single person and a woman. Okay? There were no rights for women, uh, all, sorry, almost no rights for women. All of these rights were introduced because the European Union insisted in about 1974 that Ireland mm. introduce equality laws, okay? So from that perspective, the European Union has been really, really good uh, for Ireland and particularly uh, as regards equality in Irish women. So uh, this is what really concerns me negatively. I, I don't like the okay. idea of pulling out because if, if UK pulls out of the European Union, it's not very good. I mean, we can live without them. In fact, Ireland always thought it could live without the European <laughs> Union, but for a long time. I think there's a chunk of about 10 years when I, I considered that Ireland had the, what I call the Norwegian syndrome, that Ireland <laughs> felt it was too big uh, mm -hmm. for the European Union, because for a number of years, Norway has, well, for a long time, Norway has felt it was too big for the European Union. And this happened especially around the time of the, of the referendums on the Lisbon Treaty, when Ireland said, okay, we don't need the European Union, let's, let's vote no. So this whole thing of Euroscepticism really, really concerns me. 
Moving on quickly from the sure. my concern about the negativity to the positivity. I think uh, positivity, the main thing I can see is Ireland's renewed engagement with Europe, uh, particularly at an official level. Because there was a time when, as I just mentioned, Irish people and particularly the, uh, the ministers felt that they were too big, they didn't need to go to meetings in Europe. It would do to send the ambassador in, in Brussels instead of themselves going to the meetings. So we found that the, uh, the Irish government had disengaged, uh, particularly in the second half of the, of the noughties, uh, with, with the European Union. And I think uh, what, what Jim has said there about, about the Troika and the feeling that you need the European Union much more. I mean, I'm hearing from the Department of Finance that what they want to do is they want to ensure that in the next financing period, the period 2014 to 2020, Ireland maximizes its take from European Union funds. And remember that ever since 1973, Ireland has been getting money from the European mm. Union. It has always been a recipient of EU funds. This is on things like common agricultural policy, common fisheries policy, and all of, of the other Fisher policy areas. Mm. There's just one other thing I want to say, Shane, sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't hog it because I know Mary really keeps okay. me of hogging things as well. I want to get back to this issue of the bank guarantee, okay? And everybody said the bank guarantee was a bad thing. We hated the bank guarantee. In the Commission, we were furious that the Irish acted unilaterally in 2008 and went ahead with that bank guarantee. But what could we do? We were faced with a situation where the Irish had moved ahead, had done something on their own, and then we had to patch things up afterwards. Okay? But nobody knew about it. It wasn't discussed with us beforehand, and there was skin and hair flying, to be honest with mm. you, uh, when, we heard, when we heard this. Mm. And I mean, Mary knows no more about it than this because she was personally involved in the issue. But it wasn't the... European Commission that insisted that the bondholders get paid. Ireland was sovereign in this regard. It okay. was Ireland decided that all the debts would be paid. Okay, thank you very much. Mary? Well, a positive uh, well, and a negative, positive please. And a negative. I think the positives are great from Europe, I really do. And when something goes wrong, we kind of neglect to think of the positives. I was thinking about education, for instance, uh, which had been my earlier lifestyle before I went into politics. And you know all the system of ITs, and I know you have a fabulous one in water with WIT. Well, all the, for a long period, the courses, many of the courses there, were funded by Europe. Europe gave the finance for the WIT and at Loan IT, where I come from, and Carlo and all the rest of them, to put on all the courses. They paid lecturers' um, salaries. They gave student grants. All of that came from Europe because Europe wanted us to get up on our feet and to have a very fine system of education. Now that was wonderful. I remember one time when I was Minister for Education, the Erasmus scheme. I don't know, I'm sure there are students here, perhaps there are students who have been on the Erasmus scheme, enabling free movement of students, as you know Shane, yes. from one college, one city, one country, to another college in another city, in another country. Erasmus is thriving. And every year, more, more countries becoming engaged in it. Now, there are two educational ends that I think are absolutely fantastic. You know, the, um, when you go back to school, and, as your college or further education is about, I mean, lots of the courses initially in those were funded from Europe. The Europe they gave the um, permission to go ahead to set them up. And there were many, many people who went back to education who had dropped out early or maybe had been working and the job went belly up, but they went back into education and Europe had the funding to give us for that. Now that alone is marvellous, it really is. Also the roads of Ireland, I came down in a thing called the M9 today, mm. and the, I mean it used to be if you wanted to go from Athlone to Waterford you had to go to Tullamore and on to Port Leisha, and then on to Carlo and then on to Kilkenny uh, and then all the ins and outs, the Mullinavat and da, 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 and all of that. You were hours on the road. I went up to near Nace and we came from that right down in the end. So sh lots of money on the roads. Now there was all, now they were co-funded, it wasn't all, but they would have been co-funded from Europe. There was also the agricultural money, the cap money. Um, for farmers, and that there's a new rural development scheme coming in now to 2020, Ireland, rural Ireland for 2020, in which very strong money, real money, I think it's two thirds Europe, one third Ireland, is being given to rural homesteads, to 
keep farmers doing, keep the exports going, keep the farm industries going. So it's been very good on that. Now they're what I regard as the positives. Now the negatives might be what you might think, and I agree, and they can be very annoying. We have it in the Midlands, for instance. There was all the bogs, you know, the raised bogs. I don't know if it's an issue down here, is it, Jane? Not so much, no. but it is a fact. But we have it very much in the Midlands, because we're from the bogs, <laughs> uh, but the, uh, where Europe decided, and, and rightly so, that there was a very special plant growing on those bogs, which was, which was unique in Europe. Holland and Ireland had the most of it, and they said we had to stop milling that, we had to stop digging at that, and we had to allow those to be preserved and conserved. And there's still a lot, now I know Jimmy Deanian has done his best and has come out yesterday with, or two days ago maybe, yes, with a policy which will help a little bit. It'll give till 2017, but in the end, and there's very generous payoffs, if you like, if you decide to give up your bog. But that can be that can be a real sore thing sure. in particular areas where it is evident. And there's a sense, and I don't know which of the two gentlemen brought it up, but there's a sense of Europe wants to interfere sometimes. You know, people like to say, oh, it's none of Europe's business, it's our business. And they may seem to be um, too much uh, in your backyard and too much sort of involved in your uh, Europe says you can't do this mm. and we don't like Irish people don't like that very much I don't think anybody likes that no, though, do no, they? But no. so there is that little irritant I suppose <laughs> you might call it but I regard those as very small in proportion to the positives which there are thank yeah. you very much Jane, can Tim. I have 30 seconds to come back to Go Mary on her bogs okay on, Go the, bogs. on the bogs <laughs> okay Th there is uh, some European Union legislation about what we call special areas of conservation, conservation yes okay? and this is a European Union directive which at the time was agreed by all of the member states including Ireland okay Michael D Higgins signed it well, yes. so thank you Mary for agreeing yes. with me so <laughs> Ireland, Ireland signed up to this piece of legislation mm. and then decided not to enforce it okay so the European Union said to Ireland, sorry guys, you've signed up this legislation, you've got to enforce it. And the Irish said, well, what are we going to do? And as Mary said, Jimmy Dean has added two days ago, well, we will declassify some of these, spe uh, these bogs, Just especially, some of them, some yeah, of them yeah. especially areas of conservation. Why? Because it was never the European Union who said that this bog or that bog or the other <gasps> bog should be a special area of conservation. It was the Irish who decided it. So now the Irish are undeciding. So European Union, yeah, okay, it's, it, it, it's annoying sometimes. But you've got to understand, as Jim says, that there's a bit of politics involved here. You know, Michael D or whoever goes and he signs up to a, a piece of legislation, mm. and then he comes home and every forgets about it for ten years. Not such time as the European Union tries to tries to enforce <laughs> it. Tries so to enforce it. Yeah. yeah. So sorry, that was just an answer it's, to yeah, the Yeah, but okay. it's enforcement sometimes. Yeah. Jim, yeah. Jim, do you have any opinions on bogs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have I'm to from say. The bog country. <laughs> The reason why it's not an issue down here is the land is too good, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're right, you're right, yeah, yeah. Good for you. You're camping yourselves. I'll, good for you. I'll bring you for your drive out the Cork Road in a few minutes, Mary. Yeah. No, I suppose, th I have to say, I was a little bit dismayed in the last couple of days when I heard Jimmy Dean and had declassified some of the bogs, because I would have thought that the conservation of raised bogs is a good thing. You know, and I think Europe's influence in that regard is very benign, mm. it's very positive, because if economic arguments are allowed to dictate everything, uh, those bogs would disappear, and I think that would be a serious cultural heritage loss for Ireland. So I, I, I would like to see the raised bogs being preserved. Okay. Speaking of something else that possibly needs preserving or not, I don't know, I was listening to an American economist on the radio earlier in the Krugman, week whose name yeah, escapes me now. Paul Krugman. Krugman. Paul Krugman, that's, yeah. That's the one. Mm. And um, he uh, was, was commenting, as I've heard other economists commenting on before, about how the euro can kind of be a lead weight around our necks sometimes. Um, and I've heard several people over the years kind of talking about, you know, should Ireland stay in the euro? Should it, you know, jump ship when things get tough? Um, again, starting with, with, with Jim, Oh no, Tim has got his hand up, yeah? No, can, can I start? Because yeah. I just want to give a sort of a bureaucratic European Go perspective okay. before Great. we get to the economic perspective. Okay. The euro was never meant as an economic instrument, never. 
it was a political instrument, always first and foremost. Okay, I'm going to stop you. The, the, the explain that one the, to me. It's a currency. A currency. The, currency. The, but the yeah. idea was to bring the peoples of Europe closer together, so that, for example, I live in Belgium. I drive to France. I spend the same currency in France as I have in Belgium. I drive to Germany. It's the same currency. Uh, I drive to, or I fly to Spain or Portugal, it's the same currency. So the idea is that you're creating, or underlining this idea of it being Free a single market. market. Yeah, uh, yeah. So you've got the, mm. your four freedoms. That's the principle of the European Union, okay? So, I mean, the thing is that the, the euro was never mm. something which was based on economics. It was always a political, <laughs> it's a dream. Huh? And this is why people said to me, two years ago, they said, the euro is finished, the euro is gone. And I said, cool it, okay? Forget about the economists. I'm oh, sorry, Jim. This is, <laughs> this is political. The politicians will sort this out. Don't you worry. And what happened? The e ECB stepped in, yes. and everything was back to normal. They've sorted, have they, yeah? There you go. Wow. OK, so sorry, just going to get the speaking for us. OK, so fair enough. Uh, I think Jim is about to expire if he doesn't say <laughs> something there. So, <laughs> Listen, I, I, I could take you into my office. And I have a couple of shelves. <laughs> I, I have a couple of shelves of EU documentation from the 90s. That whole project was an economic project. It was, but it was, it, it was a political objective dressed up in economics, because all of the arguments were, were, if you join the single currency, transaction costs will be reduced, you will increase inter-European trade. They are all economic arguments. For us, they're political arguments. Okay, because you're absolutely right. For example, Ireland, you say it's 1% of the European GDP. I agree 100%. There is no one-size-fits-all when you talk about monetary policy, and this was the, this was the issue. In fact. Absolutely, and I mean, if, if you believed that Irish governments would be capable of managing a small open economy in a monetary union, um, great. What would have happened after 99? You know, when we joined the Euro in 99, the Irish economy was at the <gasps> peak of the real Celtic tiger. You know, gr growth was very strong. We had a very competitive economy, a lot of foreign direct investment, a very vibrant export sector that fed into the rest of the economy, okay? Um, when we joined the euro, the rest of Europe, particularly France, Germany, the core countries were struggling economically. So the European Central Bank brought interest rates down to the level that suited the big countries, totally inappropriate for Ireland. At the same time, the euro fell sharply in value. So what Ireland ended up was a very strong economy was suddenly hit with an interest rate bonanza, an exchange rate bonanza. So we threw fuel in on top of a fire that was already burning very brightly. If the Irish political system had been acting properly, as the EU commissioner recommended in 2001, 2002, mm -hmm. when McCreevy gave him the two fingers, if Ireland had listened to the commission at that stage, he did, if, if Ireland had listened, listened to the Commissioner at that stage, we would have tightened fiscal policy. We would have not have had the political fiasco of benchmarking of public sector pay. We would not have had the special savings accounts. We would not have seen current spending on the day-to-day -day running of the country grow 10 to 12% per annum. So in other words, the one tool we had at our disposal to manage our economy, fiscal policy, that is taxation and government expenditure, was used totally incorrectly. It just fueled a fire and blew the Irish economy out of the water. I think the euro would be a fantastic idea for Ireland if we were capable of behaving responsibly, as the commissioner did point out. And I was at a lunch, a dinner in Dublin in 2001, 2002. It was the Spanish, yeah. I forget his name, the <gasps> Spanish EU commissioner had given Ireland the warning. And, and you and had money, a dinner yeah, sorry, as a result yes. of that? Pardon? You threw a dinner as a result of that? No, no. The commission threw a dinner in Dublin to get oh, right, the commissioner okay. to meet economists mm. just to talk about. Mm. And mm. all but two economists around the table were utterly rude to the commissioner. I mean, one senior economist with a financial institution actually called him, and I quote, I'm not going to use the direct words, but I kind of quote, you effing idiot, you don't understand Ireland. And there were two economists present that night who said the commissioner was correct, uh, John Fitzgerald, Leah Soraya, and myself. But that was typical, and I wrote about it at the time in the examiner, so I can go back and show you, you know, I'm, I'm not making up rewriting my own history. But the fact was, you know, if we had listened to the external advice, 
things would have been much, much better. But in answering your question, Shane, in a very roundabout way, <laughs> um, we're so far into the single European currency project yeah, at this so juncture. Yeah. You know, if the logistical, the political, the economic consequences of <sighs> unilaterally leaving the euro at this stage would be suicidal, in my view. Okay, Mary, um, following on from what Tim and, and, and Jim have said there, and looking at Ireland in this post-Troika environment, I mean, are our problems, or the problems that we have faced and are continuing to face to a degree, are they down to a personality flaw in the Irish psyche? I mean, Jim is referring to us being irresponsible, habitually irresponsible in our, in our behaviour. Well, for a period, yes, e economically. But if you, I think that I agree with, I think it was Jim, perhaps it was Tim, it said that we, there is a sense of optimism now, but we have to keep, that's why I don't agree with, you know, there was a lot of newspaper talking when the Troika finished their, six, with their last stint. We now they're left, we're going to have a day of celebration, we're going to have a week of celebration, we're going to have a year of celebration. Celebration of what? We are already in Ireland, we're, sp we're spending every year twice as much as we're taking in in taxes. It's, it's costing twice as much to run the country as we are taking in. Now, if you call that fecklessness or irresponsibility or whatever, but we've a long road to go yet. So the idea that we'd all throw our sweaty caps in the air and say, um, we're home and dry and we're good people again. No, that's not the way. We have to, we have to cut our co coat according to our cloth and we will have to trim our sails more. But I do think that there's inherent in within Irish people, and I have found it over long years of dealing with people, there is a sense of wanting to do right by your country. There's a sense of wanting to do right by your family, particularly by your family. And there's a sense of wanting to see Ireland on the correct path again. And I think we're on it now, and but we have to stay on it, and that means a lot of very hard medicine yet to come, but it will be applied by ourselves to ourselves. Going to mean for the future, you know, how, you know, have we seen it as bad as it's going to get, I suppose, is the big question I'm going to ask. Uh, can yep. I start with that as sort of the neutral observer, because okay. I mm -hmm. shouldn't really be concerned about Irish things. But, I mean, you call it austerity, but why austerity? This has a very negative connotation. I mean, I think it was Mary said earlier that way back in uh, 2008, the, with the gap between the money the Irish state was taking in and was spending was, mm. uh, I mean, I think that the spending was 50 billion euro more or less, and the income coming in was about 30 billion euro more. Now it has come down that, over the years. That yes. was because uh, Ireland entered into what, what we in the Commission call as a, uh, a deficit, which is not cyclical, but you know, a definite, which is structural. What a we call a it's a fiscal structural dis, yeah. deficit, okay? And the, the thing is that, uh, as Jim said earlier, you know, if Ireland tried to balance the books in 2008, it would have meant that the Irish government would have had to pull this 20 million out of somewhere, out of probably expenditure, which would have meant that you'd have to cut people's salaries and halves. So what actually happened was not austerity, okay, but it was sort of softly, softly towards the so-called Maastricht targets that Ireland had signed up for in the Maastricht Treaty in 1993. Tim, in anyway. successive budgets, I have been repeatedly kicked by um, you know, the various changes and cuts and things that have been made. And I think most people would probably feel the same way. It feels like austerity. It may feel like austerity, but somebody like me, having, having lived abroad, okay, you go to your, your local supermarket in Belgium, and the woman, because normally it's a woman at the cash desk, will speak to you in French, or she'll speak to you in Dutch, or she'll speak to you in German, or she'll speak to you in English, whatever. Um, Polly lots, as we call them, okay? But that woman is taking home 800 euro a month. 800 euro a month, okay? I know it's maybe unfair to compare the two things, but in Ireland, people who are unemployed probably get the same amount of money. The difficulty was that what happened in Ireland over the period was you had hyper, really hyperinflation. <coughs> because of the increase in property prices, people's salaries increase, people's expectations increase. So now, we don't have a period of austerity, we have a period of retrenchment, where Ireland has got to come back uh, to the more sort of European norm. 
uh, you might remember some years back the, the German ambassador got into huge he trouble said, yeah. uh, for saying that his daughter was a surgeon in Berlin with earning 80 or 90,000 euro a year and she's one of the top paid surgeons in the hospital and what were the guys in Ireland doing you know drawing home 230,000 or whatever so I'm afraid that people's expectations increased mm -hmm. dramatically over the period of the Celtic Tiger uh, and unfortunately people were saying well you know Ireland is the third or the second, depending on what time the survey was taken out, a second or third uh, richest country in Europe in terms of GDP per head of population. But, I mean, maybe Jim might discuss this later, but I think that GDP per head of population, as far as the Irish are concerned, is a very, very bad measure. We should look at GNP, MP, which is yeah, domestic yeah, economy. Yeah. And in that case, Ireland is in about 11th or 12th position in the European Union. Okay, explain so the Ireland difference between GNP and GDP. Okay, the difference between GNP and GNP. Sorry, Jim, I'm going to be doing it in layman, layman's terms. Mm. Uh, GDP is inflated by the profits that the foreign multinationals make, uh, in, in essence, okay? So therefore you have some blockbuster drugs that are being produced in Ireland, which are very profitable for the, for the foreign direct investment companies. I mean, places like Clonmel, there's quite a lot of, of companies there, Cork and uh, indeed in Waterford, you had some big multinational companies, and they make quite a lot of profits uh, from the, the products that are manufactured here. And those profits have the impact of inflating the Irish GDP. So the difference between the Irish GDP and national GNP is one of the highest in Europe. So it's, it's very difficult. I was looking at some, some data yesterday, uh, which had to do with the, the balance of payments uh, between the European Union and, and the rest of the world. And you know that Ireland has the third highest uh, balance of payments with, with the outside world among the European Union countries. And what creates that, the, the drugs created? You know that Ireland is one of the leading countries in the world for leasing aircraft. You know, sometimes whether a plane is p bought or sold has a big impact on Ireland's uh, GDP figure. So uh, the, 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 the figures have been played around. And in the Commission, we also use GDP for most things, okay. with, the, with the exception of, of certain payments. Uh, and when you look at the GDP, it can be very misleading. So uh, Irish people really thought that they were, were rich and they could spend lots of money. So I would have to come back to my original uh, pr proposal, which is, it's not austerity, it's just retrenchment, coming back to a situation uh, where Ireland should have never got to in the first instance. Okay, all right. I don't like your answer, but okay. Uh, you don't. I didn't expect you to. <laughs> Jim? Retrenchment, um, what you said. Retrenchment, yeah. Mm. I, I didn't, or you could call it living within your means. You know, it's another mm -hmm. description. Um, one of the questions I didn't answer a bit of it was the negative. Yeah. And the negative to me is the level of debt we have yeah. at a sovereign level, 124% of GDP. Um, that will absorb between 8 and 10 billion in debt servicing costs per annum over the next 10 years at least, okay? Um, and to put that 8 to 10 billion in context, um, Next year, we're going to take in around 40 billion in tax, yeah, around 40 billion in taxation. So almost a quarter of our total tax take flows out of the country servicing the debt. So that's the big negative. And the problem with that, and, and this, this, this is where the argument gets quite emotional. Um, we, we, we are spending too much. We're not collecting enough, okay? So we've got to get rid of the mm. deficit. Um, and we've got to bring down the debt level as quickly as possible mm. because it is just absorbing resources out of the economy. One of the problems is that 64 billion of that debt is related to the banking system. Okay, about 34 to 35 billion went into a black hole never to be seen again, which is called Anglo and Irish nationwide. But the other 30 to 34 billion approximately, we may get some of that back because our investment in AIB will eventually bring some money back to us. Uh, we're already starting to take some profit out of the investment in Bank of Ireland. But it's that 34, 35 billion, that's the real issue. If we didn't have that, our public finance situation would be very, very manageable. But if you assume, and I make this assumption based on what I hear out of Germany, the Germans do not believe there should be retrospective bank deals, okay? So in other words, you pump that 34, 35 billion into those banks, you live with the consequences. That's, that's the German attitude. Okay, and, and it's, it's easy enough to understand where they're coming from, because they're being asked to pay for it. Yes. And they're missing the point that by doing that, we save German banks. But, you know, that's, that, that's a kind of an academic argument, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, that's the knock on. Yeah. Uh, but, but what it all means that unless we get some sort of debt deal, our 
budgetary situation is going to remain pretty awful for a long time. So while <coughs> budgets taking out three and a half to four billion out of the economy will lessen dramatically, we'll get a lot of neutral budgets. The day of getting some of the stuff back is a long way away. So we're, we're going to live in tight fiscal constraints for the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Mary, can you give me a more comforting answer than the two No, boys? that's exactly what I started. That's what I yeah, said. Yeah. We have that was, they both have taken up my point. Mm. I, uh, we, we will have to live tightly uh, from now on for as long as we can. But there are signs, I think there are signs of jobs. Uh, new firms coming in, foreign direct investment is good into Ireland, not both last year and it seems to be good for the coming year. If the signs are there. So there will be more jobs, and more jobs mean more taxes going around, more money going around the countryside, more people going to shops. Retail is still very bad. But if, if people have more spending money, they'll be able to go shopping. I'm doing it very plainly talking, but it's the truth. If the money, if there are jobs, there's more money. And where there's more money, there's more retail, life will be that bit better. It all really depends on jobs. If people can get jobs, they have money in their pocket, they have perhaps even if they have to meet their mortgages and their property tax and their, if they ever get to the bottom of the water tax, uh, when they've all that done, they still will have some money if there's jobs. And I think jobs are key, are the key to sure. the future. And I would hope that, and I know that Waterford has been a long time waiting for some foreign direct investment of a decent sort. And I would hope, now I'm no longer in politics, but I would hope that Waterford's turn will come because it's well due, a, a, like a good big plant, you know, that has a future, a pharmaceutical or a, one of those plants that will be able to um, employ a decent amount of people, pay good wages, have a good product, which in turn has a good market. So I'm hopeful for that, and I'm sure no more, more hopeful than the Waterford people themselves. Yes, it's wonderful that you're having 1,100 of Vikings and 11, uh, Waterford, such a, a wonderful city, such an old, old city, but we need the bread and butter jobs as well. For sure, mm. for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mary has been clamouring for questions from the yeah, audience. Well, so, I'd love uh, to see them. I can't see them. Can we get them. the lights up any higher there? Is that possible? I can see to the right and to the left, but not down the middle. Um, okay, anybody got any questions and up then? Up here, of course. There's a whole lot up here. Oh, yeah, there are. I hope you're not going to throw tomatoes or something. <laughs> you they, we save that till the end. Oh, do usually you? Usually in the yeah. lectures. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone got any questions then? Yes, at the back, yeah. Sorry, we can't. Can you hear? I can hear you. I'll repeat. Yeah. yeah. No, I think. Mary started saying about what happened to Yorkshire, right? I can't hear. Can you? What relief would they have in the first place after they were wiped out once they died and what would they have left with? Oh, yeah. I know. I get your point. Yeah. Okay, so the question is what, what belief does Mary have in um, politicians doing the right thing for the country going forward, yeah, seeing as all politics is local? No, go. Oh, no, she doesn't yeah. have any crib about politics being local. <laughs> no, no, I know you don't. Yeah. It's that you want to see politicians doing what's best for their country. Yeah, and that's always been the way. You will have politicians who literally give their lives for their country. My nephew, Brian Lenehan, did. He did. And all my family, and I want to say this because I know that people feel cynical about politics. My father was a politician. And he used to say to me how to live my life. And I lived my life. And I never took a penny from anyone. Neither did my brother Brian, or neither did my nephew Brian Lenehan. We saw our job as politicians as being noble people. You were paid well, but you worked for your country. And you worked night and day to see your country right. We need more people like that. We do not need people who just are in it for the money and for the bit of glory. No, I quite agree with you. There has to be a coming back to what the Greeks and Romans held politics as a noble profession. You present yourself when you go around. It means very easy to poke fun at politicians, very easy. But I say to people, why don't you go forward? Oh, I wouldn't go to doors and ask for votes. Well, then why not? 
If you go to a door and you ask for a vote, you're establishing a contract between you and the person from whom you are requesting the vote. There is a contract made between you. But I fully agree with you that there needs to be a nupping. There needs to be bringing politicians onto a level where what they do is for their country and, and for Ireland, and for Ireland's role in Europe, of course, and we're talking about that. And if there were more politicians who thought and acted like that, we would be a better country. There's no doubt about that. Well okay, uh, gentlemen down the back. You're the commissioner now, are you? There was shell holes in their funds because the fishermen oh, yeah. tried to cut fish. Yeah. And because of the sellout that was done the Spanish. on the fisheries, yeah. not on the farmers, but on the fisheries, we had to put up with that. And I remember Commissioner Gallagher from Donegal at the time and uh, Shane Crennan tried to justify the action that had been taken. That's an aside. So I, I quite accept, sir, that you are here tonight to put a case forward. says we have 28 countries. The trouble is our manufacturing base throughout Europe is being decimated by cheap imports from China and Korea and Japan. And our, our home industry cannot compete with the price structure that's going on in these other countries at ridiculously low levels. How can a company or a business or a person or an entrepreneur not to make case for the next door neighbour, I'm talking in terms of setting up viable production unit based in Ireland, funded in Ireland, with Irish people in it, who will not leave when the tax is being changed. Where can that person or that business look for its future within Europe and specifically within Ireland to create the employment that Mary says is so necessary for us? Mm. Not water flat. Mm. You said Mary what a beach we had something. We could fish we had water flat. I know. Yeah. So we take, um, we'll take Jim first and then Tim can respond. Yeah. Okay, um, I suppose what you described there really is the process of globalization. You know, um, as the world economy has been opened up to free trade, we're being bombarded with cheap products from China um, and countries like that. Um, and, and that is the sort of economic order as it's accepted at the moment. So there's, there's two ways of, of looking at that. I mean, we manufactured t-shirts in Donegal 15 years ago. If we today were still able to manufacture t-shirts in Donegal, to me it would represent 15 years of utter failure. Because as Which economies be become wealthier, as the cost base and the standard of living increases, certain activities become ec uneconomic and they relocate to cheaper locations. Okay, That's what globalization is all about. So what a country like Ireland has to do, and okay, hopefully Europe will support us in terms of the corporation tax regime, okay, and other incentives, but what Ireland has to do, in my view, quite simply, is we have to make sure we have the skilled workforce to do certain things very well. And that's why if I had one wish for Ireland over the next 20 years, is that we invest twice as much money in education yeah. and the quality of the labour force. That, 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 in my view, is what will determine Ireland's success or failure in the next 20 years. It's the quality of the workforce here. And unfortunately, we're losing a lot of that quality to emigration at the moment. Hopefully, it will come back. Mm. If you look at some of the big Irish success stories, and thankfully, some of them are actually located in this region. You know, if you look at Dawn Meats, if you look at Glambia, if you look at Slavens out the road, and then you look at Kerry, um, the other side of Munster, you know, we're, we're doing certain things really well. 
and we need to build on those strengths. So it's, I, I don't think we should try and compete with China to produce T-shirts, because if we do, the whole quality of living will just decline dramatically. They are now, yeah, yeah. Phones. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, yeah, that is the challenge. China is obviously moving up the value chain as well and will increasingly compete with us in certain areas. But wh what is the alternative? Do you erect trade barriers against China, in which case you destroy the Chinese economy, you create a serious political landmine that would threaten the security of the global economy? I think it is in the interests of global security and political stability to have China become a wealthier, more prosperous country. I just want to give Tim a chance to respond there, Yeah, Tim. I mean, uh, firstly, thank you very much for, for my instant promotion. Uh, I'm not it's actually a commissioner, yeah. because that's, re that's a really political job. Yeah. So people like Morgig, like people like Morgig, <laughs> I'm, getting paid to, I'm getting paid to do that. That's my job. I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to be It's your authoritative to about tone, Tim, Union. you see. Anyway, <laughs> listen, about the fisheries. I mentioned earlier that the European Union was an experiment. I mentioned that it was all about sharing sovereignty. And in this context, sharing sovereignty also unfortunately means sharing the little fishes, okay? What I would say is that if, if you go back to 1970, 1971, 1972, when negotiations were going on about the uh, Ireland's entry into the EU, the ne Irish negotiators went out to Europe blindfolded and with their hands tied. Why? Because nobody knew what fish the Irish fishermen were, collect, were, were fishing from the seas. Okay? So there was no base on which to start the negotiations. And that was really, really unfortunate. So I'm not saying it was the fishermen's fault that they've lost the, the quotas. <coughs> what I'm saying is that when you're negotiating in a political context, you must have, have good figures to work from. Secondly, as regards cheap imports, there is a sort of a, we have some trade tools within the, within the European Union. And one is what we call uh, import duties. Okay, yeah. our countervailing duties. And in the context of the Far East, we regularly, and I, some of my colleagues have spent many, many years doing this, we, we do what we call anti-dumping investigations. Okay, so we go to the country or the factory that's making this, these equipment, and we see whether or not, in fact, they're dumping the product on the European market. If we find they are dumping the product, we introduce what we call countervailing duties. Okay, so it's a duty that's collected by customs. Let me give you an example. Uh, three or four years ago, you might remember, there was a fruit importer in Dublin who was put to jail by revenue because he uh, evaded the duty on garlic. Okay? So what happened was the European Union put on a duty on garlic. Why? To protect the European Union producers of garlic. But this guy, when he was importing it, he was calling it apples and then subsequently selling his garlic. Okay? So he was fined or put to jail by, by the revenue because it was a revenue offence because of his duty. And that's something that the European Union do is impose these, these duties. Finally, and uh, uh, Jim gave me the opportunity to mention the Irish corporate tax regime. Let me state here and now, okay, that the European Union has no interest, no interest whatsoever in changing the Irish rate of corporation tax. There is only one entity that can change the Irish corporate tax rate and that is the Irish government, mm. okay? And I have to say that, reason being that in the European Union, uh, areas are to do anything to do with taxation has got to be agreed unanimously. Okay? So therefore, 28 member states must agree to change the rate of corporation tax if the Commission made a proposal to do it, which we have no intention to make any proposal to do it. So people sometimes get confused with, uh, as it was a few years back, Sarkozy and Merkel saying, oh, Ireland should increase the rate of corporation tax because we've given them money in the bailout. Rubbish. There is no connection like that. It will never happen that anybody other than the Irish government will raise the, the Irish rate of corporation tax. I just wanted to, to clarify okay, that. Okay, thank you. No, but the gentleman's question... That's Mary, Jim. Sorry, Jim has to run, yeah. unfortunately. I, I just want to make my apologies. I have a, an engagement in DCU at 6 o'clock, so um, thank you very much for your attention. And Thanks, Jim. Bye, Jim. Bye, <laughs> <laughs> See you, Jim. Take care. Can I go back to the gentleman uh, for the question? Um, because, of course, you see, we, we have to strive more and more to be good at what we're good at. 
And we look at all the agricultural products which we're now producing, which Bordbia, with great skill and professionalism, are selling for us all over the world. The Chinese now are interested in huge exports which we're going, which we're doing new markets. We're getting markets in China. They can make their t-shirts, but we're getting our market for our agricultural goods. And that's a very good thing. And also there is the um, there is the incentives which Enterprise Ireland are giving towards local industries. Now I know you say it's not making cake for your next door neighbour, and that's a nice small thing, and it's a good thing if you're if you can build and build and build. And I think that we are therefore having to emphasise more and more what we're good at. But I do agree with the education. I heard somebody on the radio yesterday. I've, I'm a thing, I've a thing about radios, I don't know about the rest of you, but I love listening to the radio and because I'm a widow and live alone, I have a radio in the bedroom and I have a radio in the living room and I have a radio in the kitchen. So wherever I go there's something on and I'm <laughs> listening. But they, uh, they were saying that the system of apprenticeships, which was powerful always in European um, European work, wasn't it? The apprenticeships, and the same in Ireland. But somehow we've come away from the idea of apprenticeships, and they're terrific. But the employers have to get in on them. The employers have to take on the young people who will who will uh, do the apprenticeships. And the youth guarantee, which is coming now from Europe, is very good. The Irish government have put forward their proposals. They're gone to Europe to be considered. If you're under 25 and you're out of either four months without out of a job or out of employment or out of training, you're going to get a right, it's called a youth guarantee, that you will either be subsidised through a job, i.e. perhaps an apprenticeship, or through internship, or through, um, you can go back to school and training. And I met today a lovely man who had been working for a number of years and he'd now gone back to further education. But that that's going to be guaranteed from Europe. So that if you're four months out of a job, isn't it four months? If you're four months out of a job, you will, not, you will be taken up. Well, if you want to be, of course, you can't be forced to do it. But you will have an option of further training, hopefully apprenticeships or through internships, or you will have a chance of a job or you will have a chance of further education or training. Now, I think that's very good for Ireland if we can go down that path. When I think the, the Irish government's programme has gone to Europe, and I think there'll be decisions by, I suppose, by the middle of the year, is it? Uh, yeah, the idea is to start as soon as possible, in fact. That's right, yeah. They'll come back to us and say, yeah, we like those ideas, and I'm very hopeful that apprenticeships, which is the bedrock of young people, men or women, getting the skills to enable them to then set up an industry of their own. Do you do apprenticeships now up in we the, in the Further College? No, I don't think we do anymore. No, um, it, well, it was a, a part and parcel, yeah. Yeah, I think it was, absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to have to wrap it up there. Uh, um, no, no, I'm no, afraid no. so. <laughs> very, very quickly, though, because we are on a, on a, ti on a timeline. Yeah. Yeah. Not really. Yeah, go on, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have cut across you, yes. Politicians, they make the policy, right? Who advises them? Civil servants. Civil servants. Mm. Who advises them to just take points from the office of county to the top economist and top economic companies who get millions, have got millions, and are still getting millions out of this country, right? So 
Is that correct? Do we have the economist saying, oh no, no. As if my recollection is correct, when we go back to when we had our big downfall, big blow up, I don't <coughs> recollect too many economists telling us, oh sorry lad, that's not the way to go. Yeah. Now I'm an army voter. Yeah, that's I right. don't have degrees in economy or anything like that. I'm just uh, talking about a voter. By the way, the taxpayer who pays all this fee. Mm. More economists, yeah. These are the people that put the money into the bank. And it went belly up. So who are we to believe? Who are we to believe now? Now, luckily, I'm not a skeptic. I was voting in the European election. But if some of the idea for this was to convince people, look, stay in Europe, be a European, be a good, strong European, you know, I'm not so sure that this chap would have persuaded us. When people here spoke about the, um, the importation of stuff from <coughs> the, the Asian countries, the BRICS countries, for instance, right? This country, you, you have an interest in this, may I, because you were involved uh, sometime in the past. You laid the foundation. We bought a whole lot of new trains recently, the last seven or eight years. Okay. New what? Where do they come from? Trains. Spain. Spain. Trains. Where do they oh, come yeah. from? Oh, yeah. Spain. Yeah, the BRIC countries. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, they, 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 they did not come from Spain. Spain, yeah. They came yeah. from Korea. Was it? Korea. Some of them they were Korea. Korea. They were. Mm. Some of the, the somebody said they came from Spain. Some of the engines were Korean, but built in Spain. Okay. Right. I'm sure that was to get around some kind of a protective law that we had. But we don't really have. When when we're talking about the EU you now, there was originally the common market. Reason to protect. The European countries have to have an antidote for the big, like the United States, South America, South Africa, the, big, the other big players in, in the game. That was the idea here. It was progress on to become the, the EU now. But we had a threat from Brazil some time ago in Argentina. Yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was a serious threat. Yeah. And Tim, when you mentioned that Sarkozy and Merkel, mm -hmm. they just mentioned the fact that our top, top attack was. Those are threats. Yeah. They are, I beg your pardon, but they are threats. To the ordinary Irish people, that's a threat. It is a definite threat. And it scares us. Because again, I'm an ordinary voter. I don't really understand, uh, I'm not supposed to understand it. But when Sarkozy on, and when he was the president and Merkel said, oh sorry lad, no, this will have to go. We get scared. Yeah, yeah. Now what are you guys doing about that? Can I, can I tell you? The folks that voted from Korea and China, like technologically, they are so far ahead. I would not have a problem bringing stuff technologically to into Ireland because we are not there. We aren't there yet. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Can, yeah, I appreciate your point. We just let this gentleman just finish his point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, um, here. Yeah. 
the ICF. And, and tell me, are you on a, are you on a job bridge I'm now? No, no, but yeah. I'm well, Well, I, d I don't know because, like you, I have a bit of scepticism every day when I listen to the radio and say, I hear there's such a firm going to set up and they're going to make 300 jobs. And I wonder, where, who, how do I know so many unemployed people, young men and young women, in and around my own town in Athlone? But I think internship and, jo and job bridge, there are some good and there are some bad. Um, I have a niece in Dublin and she has four law degrees, and she was in Cambridge, and she's back, and she's in, an in a job bridge for one year. She left it, and she's now in another one, an internship one. And she is a qualified barrister and a qualified solicitor. She said the exact same question to me the other night. How am I going to get out of it? Well, the only way that... I think there's job... Sh the, the good points about job bridge and internship is, for someone who's unemployed, it gets you into the way of work again. Gets a person up, getting up out of bed, going off, they have a job to go to, they have to smarten themselves. I'm not talking about you now, I'm talking in generality. They have to smarten up, they have to get out, there's hours to keep, they have to get on with people in an office or in a warehouse or wherever they are. They have to get on with people, they go for lunch, they have coffee. Opportunities kind of come out of it. But they're not the end. In, they're not an end in itself. And you're wondering if there's no money around, how is how is anyone going to get jobs out of them? We can only do that if the economy picks up, and the economy is picking up. If we look at job jobs as an, an indicator of the economy picking up, it is. Wouldn't you agree, yeah. Tim? If there's no other, we have no other indicator. If the number of unemployed continue to go down and the number of employed go up, it will be a better economy and there will be more jobs. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm saying this and I'm not at all of the politics of the government, but I believe it as a citizen of this land. And I have a young family who in turn all have young children and they'll all be coming into the, into the jobs market. But the only way we can do that is <coughs> if the economy continues to improve. And if it continues to improve, the job market will improve and people will get jobs. And in the meantime, if, you're, if a person was lucky enough to get into a job bridge and an internship, which offered at the end of it, and 60% of those who do those jobs, uh, part, uh, 12 months, get into a real job afterwards, a paying job. And that's worthwhile if it works out and you've got a job. In the meantime, if you can do, I told my niece in the one she's in now in Dublin, what you do, Anita, I said, is you make yourself indispensable in that internship you're in. Whatever you're doing and you've give, been given to do, you come in every day, be smart and bright, and make yourself indispensable. And she said they've been hurt. She's nearly coming to the end of her time. They've said to her the other day, her lady over her said, do you know, I think we we'll, won't we'll be able to do without you. Well, wouldn't that be great? She'll get a job. So, you see, there's just opportunities in things if we can go for them. But there will be money generated if there are more is there more employment? More employment will mean less reliance on social welfare, more money freed up there. It will mean more people earning and paying taxes. And it's the paying the taxes that brings in the money. Sorry? Yeah. Would that not help then by, by creating a better retail? Like if 
Okay. Sorry, can, ten, yeah, ten. Can, can I come in very And we're on a few, yeah, we're going to... Very so, briefly. Yeah, very briefly. We have to finish up okay, on this fine. one, lads. So, yeah. that, I'll answer the questions in reverse order, okay? Just to answer that question specifically, the European Union is always interested in getting more competence because we, we like to be able to sure, make sure that things are even across the European Union. But will we get competence in the area of social welfare? Not in my lifetime. It's for the member states to do it. If the member states want mm. to give it to the European Union, then fine, but I don't believe they have any interest in doing it. To answer the lady here about the job bridge, what I would say is that... You know, it's very difficult for governments to create jobs. All they can do is create the environment to allow jobs to flourish, okay? And this is what the Irish government are trying to do at the moment. This is what the European Union is trying to get every member state to do, is mm. try uh, to encourage yeah. people to yeah. create a feel-good factor. Because when there is a feel-good factor, people feel better, uh, things will work out. It's got, we always said that after a country comes out of a recession, it takes 18 months for the jobs to start climbing again. And that has started happening in Ireland. When you look at all the data, all the data is extremely positive for Ireland. I'm getting data every day of the week, and I send around to my colleagues another bit of good news about the Irish economy, another bit of good news about the Irish economy. I'm not an economist, but the numbers are very, very good. To answer this gentleman here, uh, criticism, them. Can I just put this event in, in perspective, okay? The well, idea is to, to, to start a discussion about the European Union, because we feel, certainly in, in my office in Dublin, that we don't go around the country often enough and talk to people and listen to people. So yeah. what we're doing with this event is, we, we're saying that because the European Parliament elections are coming up, let's have these events around the country and let's throw open the floor to people who have different views or who want the opportunity to talk and to say something about the European Union. It's not that we're trying to propagandise, it's just that we're providing an open forum and thanks very much to the York Drag Centre here in Waterford for hosting us today. Uh, you know, it's really been a pleasure to yeah. come and speak to you and, and listen to you and hear your concerns. But sorry, that's all I want to say. Thanks yeah, Tim. Uh, Mary has the last word. But I do think that I, if I have a criticism of today, it is that I didn't get to speak individually to people. I would far prefer that there were more questions, Jane. I know you had an awful lot on your plate, and thank you for the way you guided it. You kept, I nearly went for, for um, Jim Power's throat at one stage, <laughs> but uh, you kept a, an even keel on it. But, and I would like that there would be more questions and I would meet more people. It is exactly as Tim said. It is because people say, oh, you're blah, 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 blah. That's all up there and I've no time for it. And what does it mean to us? It means enough. It means really, it's our, it's our everyday life is bound up now in Europe. It's bound up in your own country and your country is bound up in Europe. And really all of us were only on this life once and I always believe, grab life, grab life when you can. You, know, you won't come this way again. And I know that sounds trite, but it's the truth of it. And when you get to be my age, you keep t it's getting shrinker and shrinking in. And I would really say to please vote. Remember, it, it's your stake, it's your gift, it's your stake, it's your country, it's your, it's your continent, it's Europe. And we'll do more for ourselves individually and for our, our parish and our town and our county and country if we go voting. And May, uh, May the 22nd will be the date for European elections. But thank you for putting up with me and listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hold for a second. Hold Just for a second. Just to say thank you very much on your behalf to Shane, Mary and to Jim and Tim for what has been really the start of a, what great, could be quite actually, an exciting debate. Yeah. And I'd like to remind you that the Europe Direct Information oh, Centre is available uh, seven, six days a week in Waterford City Library, and you, can, you really can uh, get information on any aspect of the European Union there. Um, when you were coming in, um, we had a draw at the door, so I would like to ask Mary if she would pick out the winning card, and we've got oh, a new e-reader. What's the prize? It's a new reader, Mary. An e-reader. Oh, yeah. an e-reader. Mm. Okay. I prefer you read my book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they can get it on the e-reader, Mary. <laughs> it's called Morris and... Morris Barry. Where's Morris Barry? Where is he? Where is he? 
you can get your prize uh, around the back of the stage here. So thanks very much, oh, and thank you all for coming. Book. Thank I you. Write on it, yes. <laughs> and don't forget Even to buy Mary's book. Send them on to you. Thank you. If anybody has the book, I'd buy. Oh, did they say that?